good if, if you can give your name and sort of um, uh, just sort of give a, a, a short bio, bio of your uh, military and government and consulting career. Just okay. In, in sort of a resume sort of way, just so we have a sense. Okay, my name is William John Pollock, and I'm 56 years old. My background initially started in the Air Force in the mid-60s, where I was a computer operations and programming specialist for first at Pope Air Force Base after training and then in Vietnam. The first event in my lifetime occurred then that woke me to a new paradigm. That paradigm was that late at night a young lady and I were in the woods in about 30 miles southeast of Fayetteville, North Carolina and had an unusual experience with a UFO at about 300 foot distance. The UFO prompted before it showed up to have all the frogs, the crickets, and all those noisemakers late at night shut off like a light switch. And it appeared 20, 30 seconds later and passed by us at about two, 300 feet on a line only 40, 50 feet away from us, heading from a southeast to a northwest direction about 11:25 at night. After it disappeared over the northwest end of a small lake we were by, there was a continued period of silence for another 20 or 30 seconds, and the frogs, crickets, and all the other noisemakers at night wound up turning back on like somebody again had thrown a light switch. That event was rather dramatic in my mind in that it prompted me to start questioning what was really going on in the world. This was a late night, clear night sighting up close, and it could not be mistaken for a helicopter or any other plane that I was aware of that the Air Force had back in 66. From that point on, I went to Vietnam and spent a lovely year there in a tropical resort community of Nha Trang and got to meet a lot of nice people, particularly the Vietnamese. But in my work, we became very involved with processing and sending on to Washington intelligence data. This was in addition to our normal computer load of maintenance reports, payroll, etc. And in that situation, it became quickly evident that we could have fought this war at a much higher level and much more efficiently than it was intended. It became obvious to all of us that it was a political war and not to be won. After that experience, I left the military in spite of the fact that almost everybody in the computer science arena was asked to stay on. In fact, the Air Force encouraged us by promising us four-year college degrees fully paid, officer's salary while we're in, etc. But none of us stayed. Several years later, I got back into using my computer knowledge when my first wife had passed away in 77, and I was asked to come and help get a firm to grow called Rusco Electronics. In the late 70s, Rusco Electronics was the largest manufacturer and installer of access control equipment in the world. A friend of mine had asked me, to help him because he wanted to leave the company and start his own company and I said yeah I'd love to you know my wife had just died and I was looking for something new to do and it quickly became apparent that everybody in the security industry was back in the old relay days of philosophically and technologically and that the industry the industry did not have very many people with computer expertise what it quickly occurred in just a year or two is I went from doing corporate level work in the Denver area, which at the time was growing like a mushroom, to doing military work, national work, and getting my, getting my security clearance back and activated again. This led to doing a lot of work for the State Department and eventually, by 1980, realizing that the firm I was with was about ready to be left in the dust technologically. We tried internally to convince them to upgrade their technology, and they would not. And I started my own firm with two other engineers in Denver, one from Hughes, uh, who was based at the time at Buckley Air National Guard Base, which is actually a primary 
site for reception of uh, satellite sat, uh, satellite data for national security purposes. And another friend at, uh, from Lockheed. Well, it was Lockheed Martin today, but it was Martin Marietta back in those days. We started the firm and developed within nine months the most powerful electronic security system at the, available at the time. In fact, we prided ourselves on having a form of Windows before Macintosh on our systems without any command codes. We just punch and click and move Windows around. And we did a lot of work. We, at one time, were doing 17, 18 major systems around the country. In fact, we did five alone for uh, Federal Express.
pained or they were brutalized or both. And one of the goals of the industry was to develop technology that would allow us to likes to cre uh, collect articles on the uh, unusual is that a lady out east had a chip removed from her body in uh, 1999. And they had it blown up on the website. And it was a slight modification of this chip from Denver with some of its enhancements. And it was put in her, she believes, in the, either 1980 or 1981. What was amusing about this was that this gentleman never had to worry about money again, and he quietly passed on a lot of this technology to somebody we never knew. And this concerned my contacts in Washington because it never went anywhere with them. Somebody else took it and ran with it, and we never knew who it was. Now, in 1984, I found another technology by just sniffing the web, sniffing the, the, the literature of our industry and a dozen other industries. And I found that there was a professor at the University of New South Wales, who where I still have the files on, that had discovered a way to make a microscopic lithium niobate chip. And by accident, he had scratched it. And he had a um, RF transmitter there. And he had a receiver on by sheer chance. And he found that on a... Uh, certain frequency, he could send an energy beam to the chip and it would respond back with a number. He worked on that technology and that technology eventually I found out about. We flew him in to Denver to our company, System Group of Colorado, and we did a test. He had some primitive small chips he brought with him. They're totally passive and very small, a 32nd of an inch, 
and only a couple thousand thick. And by etching them, you could again create a unique signature, unique to each one. And this one theoretically could, depending on the size of it and the size of the etching, could have a unique number in the billions and billions. In fact, the uh, test we did was amusing in that we <clears throat> set up a transmitter and a receiver based on removing a air grill from our drop ceiling and plugging up our transceiver into that as our antenna. And we were able to read that thing glued to a little piece of, ply of uh, cardboard from 100 feet away with a piece of grill out of a drop ceiling, which is a, a pretty primitive antenna. Because we didn't know what frequency it was dealing with, so we had to come up with some kind of instant generic antenna. We were so impressed with the capabilities of this, it would read through thin layers of material, like thin plywood. And he and I quietly kept in touch through our other contact in Washington and kept probing who these two men were. We were having a devil of a time finding who they were, who they really were. Because uh, what bothered me was that the professor all of a sudden got a giant grant. The technology was transferred. He never had to work again the rest of his life. And a friend of mine in San Francisco who I had quietly told about this technology because he was involved with other aspects of national security and tracking people. He got a project to do a physical security system, access control, cameras, intrusion monitoring, everything that works for a little company in Silicon Valley. And he said it was eerie to him, but what they were making there looked eerily like what I had described to him. He built the security system in this modern fab building billions of these little chips. 
he wound up a year later being asked if he'd want to buy the security system back. They were shutting the factory down after they'd made billions and billions of these little chips. And it was a division of a rather major European electronics firm that had the plant. Which one? Siemens. And what concerned me was that they had built these chips, and who knows what happened to them. And they built them in the billions in volume because they're so small that you can take a six-inch wafer and make hundreds of thousands of them on a wafer. And they disappeared somewhere. But in the process, what concerned me more was Bob did not give up trying to find out who these guys were and who they worked for, what their agendas were. He and I had had long talks now by the mid-'80s about what was really going on in government, who was controlling what, what concerns he had, because he had come to the realization there were a lot of things going on that weren't right. And he had supposedly made some contacts to find out more of what was going on. And he had contacted our mutual friend at CIA, another long-term contractor, been involved since World War II, in the very founding of the CIA, who got in touch with me and said, Bob's got something hot, and he's back in the country again on business. We're going to get a meeting. A few days later, Bob was on his way to work just after dropping the two boys off at a private high school, I believe, in Nairobi. He was on the way to the embassy. And he was broadsided at a stoplight at 60 miles an hour by a reinforced Land Rover. He was killed instantly. The Brit that supposedly was drunk at 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning,
scalar technology, et cetera, that we don't even think that those in Congress
But I don't know the whole story of that. We could do some research on that, Steve, and uh, go back to that web posting.
Um, example is the um, the syphilis study, and I believe it was um, Alabama.
taking out people or affecting situations.
nation. They're all involved in it, in one degree or another, and they have their black within black. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't find another few years